how do you make money with your music without having to go out and gig and leave the comfort of your own home? Well, we're going to go through 10 different ways that you can monetize your creative process. My name is Pete Johns. This is the Studio Live Today podcast. If you're watching the video version, there are timestamps in the description. You can jump around to the 10 different tips. If you're listening on the audio version, you don't have that luxury, but just sit back, relax, grab a box of popcorn, a bucket of fish, whatever floats your boat. So first of all, why would you want to make money from music? You do have to think about this up front because as soon as you go from something being a hobby, a pastime, a fun activity to a quote unquote business or even a side hustle, it does change things a bit. Uh, Take it from me, someone who has gone from doing music and music education as just something I did for fun on the side to my full-time gig, it does change some things. Not all in a negative way, don't get me wrong, it's all still cool, but there are some things that change. So you do need to first of all think about that and go, why do I want to make money from my music? Is it to get a generated second income? Do I want to do it full-time? Do I just want to see if I can? Sometimes that's part of it. So let's dive in to these 10 different things. Number one, you can distribute your music. If you've been around this channel before, you'll know that uh, I'm an advocate of creating, recording, and releasing your music. And I recommend DistroKid. They're an online music distribution platform. You can sign up. There's a link down in the description. You can save 7% off your first year on any DistroKid plan. But what DistroKid allow you to do is to get your music out there to Spotify, Apple Music, Deezer, Amazon Tidal, all of the streaming platforms, as well as iTunes and, and Amazon on to be able to actually sell your music and it is a way to monetize your music. Now, the cynical amongst us may say, well, if you're going to pay for a distribution platform, are you going to make enough money to make it back up? It's something you do have to look into because streaming royalties and sales of music have definitely decreased. They're probably at kind of the lowest that they've ever been. Now, is that to say you shouldn't do this? Well, no, because if you're going to put your music out there anyway, and people are going to be streaming it and listening to it, who might as well benefit from it? Well, you. So you can actually put your music out there using DistroKid, get folks to stream it on the Spotify's and the Apple Musics, and who knows, you might just have that one song that's the right song at the right time that's going to resonate with folks. We've seen it time and time again, and you know, what's the old misquoted Wayne Gretzky quote? You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So the good thing about a distributor like DistroKid is they allow you to release an unlimited number of songs and EPs and albums for just one yearly subscription. So it means that every time you're creating something, you can actually just throw it out there and see who likes it. And it gives you a good kind of barometer for your music as well, as well as being able to monetize it and get those, you know, cents and maybe a couple of dollars back, then you're at least going to be able to find out what people are liking, what they're listening to, what they're digging. Hey, it's that time of the year. We're here in November. It's the Spotify wrapped up stuff going on. Everyone's getting into it and uh, enjoying having your music out there. And It just kind of feels good to have your music out there next to your favorite artists just kind of feels a little bit awesome if i'm if i'm honest uh number two you can sell your music so yeah you can actually sell your music what how is what how does this different from distributing your music well there are other ways you can actually sell your music if you want to get a direct more of a direct interaction with folks places like bandcamp are actually amazing i know many uh, of my fellow musicians and fellow music creators that use bandcamp and love it because it gives folks that want to buy your album that little bit more ownership as opposed to going to itunes which let's be honest very few people use these days Going to Bandcamp, it feels like you're supporting an independent creator and an artist. And as the seller, it does have its benefits too, because you actually get more direct and kind of instant reaction there. And in terms of the monetization of things, you get paid a lot quicker and easier as well. You can really clearly see things. Uh, Distributors are great, but it can take up to three months for any sales or streams that you make to actually come through and show in the stats of your distribution platform. So there is that delay. Whereas Bandcamp is like, I put out an album, I tell all my fans and family and friends, 10 people buy it at 10 bucks each, I get the 70% cut of that, there's $70 in my pocket. Not immediately, but a lot quicker than using a distributor. There's other platforms as well. In fact, if you've got 
platforms you use and that you love and you enjoy for distributing music, drop those in the comments. If you're watching the video version or if you're on the audio version, uh, email me, let me know. Say, Pete, I've got a great platform that I use to, to share and to monetize my music. And you can do that at Pete at studiolivetoday.com. Always happy to get emails from you fine folks. Numero three merchandise now merchandise with music is as old as music itself people have been going along to gigs wearing band t-shirts for as long as i can remember i'm wearing one right now if you're looking at the video version i'm wearing my gorillas t-shirt because gorillas are awesome both the animal and the musical group so why is merchandise so powerful in the 2020s? Well, it's because you no longer have to do that thing where you print a bunch of t-shirts, where you print a bunch of stickers, where you print a bunch of caps, and you have to stick them in your spare room and then throw them in the boot or the trunk of your car or your frunk if you've got a Tesla and drive them around to gigs and try to sell them and then you've got all this excess stock. That doesn't really happen anymore because of the magic of print on demand. Now, pretty much every platform that you can find out there has some sort of print on demand service. I happen to use Spring. They used to be called Teespring. Now they're just called Spring just because of the simplicity, because of the integration into YouTube, because I'm a YouTube content creator and Spring integrates really easily into YouTube. In fact, if you're watching the YouTube version of this video, you're probably seeing down below a little shop section there that might have a hoodie or a t-shirt or something that you may want to pick up with a Studio Live Today logo on it. Just saying that merchandising is something that you can do and you can create some cool merch around a meme to do with your music, just your band name, your artist name, whatever it happens to be. People will resonate with that. And instead of just donating directly to you, if they can instead buy a $30 t-shirt that you only pay $20 for and you pocket 10 bucks, that's a pretty good deal. And that can actually help with another way of generating money with your music. I'm feeling a bit dirty talking about all this dirty, dirty money. Number four, let's talk about affiliate sales. This is something that I was super spectacle, spectacle, skeptical too. I was super skeptical of when I got into the, the whole music creation and the music education and YouTube and content creation world. However, I watched a few videos, I saw how this worked and the creepiness factor over time kind of removed for me because it's one of those things that if you do it in a bad way, see when I think of affiliate marketing, I think of network marketing, I think of pyramid schemes, I think of companies that shall remain nameless, but you're all thinking about them, that use this kind of MLM, multi-level marketing strategy to sell products. And that's kind of what I thought affiliate marketing was. It's actually very different from that. So how does affiliate sales and affiliate marketing work? You like a thing, you like a product or a service, you tell people about that product or the service, they buy or use that product or service, you get a small commission. It's as simple as that. So how can this be used badly and nefariously? Well, you can promote stuff you don't believe in. You can tell people to go to Ford VPN, just a made up name of something, which you maybe don't even use or don't even necessarily have any sort of desire to, uh, to promote, but you get a kickback every time someone uses that if they use your code. That's sort of where I thought, oh, maybe I don't want to get into this. But if you do it the right way, if you say love DistroKid and you have a DistroKid code that saves people 7% off their first year on any DistroKid plan, and then DistroKid gives you a small commission for everyone who signs up, that's kind of win-win. So if you're promoting products that you actually like anyway, it's win-win. StreamYard, I use StreamYard for my live streaming and even to record these podcasts. I love StreamYard. I recommend StreamYard to people. If people sign up to StreamYard using the link I give them, StreamYard give me a commission. It's, it's the stuff you already use. Products, so uh, I've got affiliate partnerships with Amazon, eBay, Sweetwater, and Thoman. They're like four of the biggest places that people go to buy their musical instruments, their equipment, their home recording gear. So if you go to studiolivetoday.com slash gear, all the links there are affiliate links, which means that you, you as the consumer go and buy something, you pay the same price. But if you buy that thing that I recommend you, they break off a small chunk and send it to me. 
Now, is this, is this open to creepiness and being dodgy? Yeah, sure, as is most things in life. But if it's used correctly, and if you give full disclosure, as I just have, then it's actually absolutely a good way because you've got a real person like me telling you, guess what? I love using the Steinberg UR22C audio interface. I've used it for five years. It's solid as a rock. It's great. You go, okay, I'm going to go out and check this thing out. You go to Amazon, you click the link, you buy one. You get it home, you're like, John's was right. This thing's pretty gosh darn good. Or you buy the Sennheiser HD280 Pro headphones. You're like, these things are really good. All the gear that I recommend. So that is another way that you, just anyone, and that's the thing, you don't have to be a me. You can be a you. You, you can just be a band and say, hey, here's our, here's our kit list. Here's the list of the gear that the band uses. And you set up a page and then you apply to join the Amazon affiliate program or the eBay affiliate program or the Sweetwater affiliate program. No guarantee that you'll get in because you do have to show that you're actually going to generate at least some sales for the company or for the brand. But it's, it's definitely worth looking at and uh, considering if you want to monetize your music. Number five. Patreon. Patreon has come. It has come out of nowhere and it is helping creators. I have patrons. I have a Patreon and you can go to studiolivetoday.com slash Patreon if you'd like to join. Huge shout out and thank you to all my current patrons. The way Patreon works is that folks join your Patreon for a certain amount. You can set different levels, anything from $1 to $1,000 a month, whatever you like, and you give certain rewards. Now, my Patreon setup is really simple for me as a creator. It's if you'd like to support me for as little as a dollar, you can support me and you can feel warm and fuzzy way down in the cockles of your heart. If you support me for, for $5 or more, then different sort of things come into that. And $10 or more, you get a, a monthly exclusive live stream uh, and uh, other stuff included as well. Go to studiolivetoday.com slash Patreon. I don't want to put all the detail here because it kind of changes and morphs over time. And I don't want this to be outdated in the future. But Patreon is actually a good option. If you've got people that want to support you and you're doing something, like the whole concept of, remember back in the day where like artists, how do you think artists, how do you think Monet and these folks made their money? Well, some of them didn't. Some of them <laughs> lived in poverty. But how do you think they made their money? It was because the, the big rich kings and tycoons, they wanted to commission. They, want, they were patrons of the arts. And it's the same with music. There were patrons of these arts. There were benefactors. There were people that were sponsoring and supporting the creators because they knew that d creators don't actually create a thing. Thing, a physical, tangible thing. If you're a baker, you get up in the morning and you bake a whole bunch of loaves of bread and then you sell them to all the customers and you make the difference between your ingredients and your time and what you can sell the loaves of bread for. If you, you were creating the symphonies and, and operas back in the day, yeah, people could you could sell tickets to, to your symphony or to your opera and people could come along to that. There was definitely that. But how did you sort of fund your day to day? How did you get up and, and have your, your morning cup of wine and bread in the morning? Well, you needed, you needed patrons to do that. And the Patreon model continues with that, continues keeping us in, in wine and bread breakfasts. Man, some of the, some of the analogies uh, that I go off on are a bit weird. Uh, so check out Patreon, patreon.com. Anyone can join up and create a Patreon. Make sure you've got something to offer, I guess. Uh, so for a band, if you're a musical artist, some things that are pretty cool to offer there are like exclusive songs, early releases of your music, behind the scenes stuff, live streams, ask me anything, direct access to the band or to you as a creator, a separate email address where people can suggest things. There's a heap. There's so many different things. I'm sure your creative juices are already flowing as to in terms of what you can put into your Patreon offering. Number six is something that I got to admit, I am really self-conscious about. Yeah, I'm really self-conscious about this one because it feels awkward. It feels awkward to ask for donations. Yeah, I don't know. If you've, if you've ever done any sort of charity drive and you've had to ask for people for donations, that's hard enough, but you're like, well, that's for a good cause. Asking for a donation from someone for you to just pay your electricity bill or uh, send your children to school because it's your job, it does feel a little bit awkward. And it's taken me a while to realize that this is actually not that bizarre these days. This is not something, and in fact, people want to help. 
People want to help out. And it's the same with, with my favorite bands and my favorite artists and my favorite creators. I have contributed to them. I have made direct financial donations to them. And it makes me feel good. Knowing that it's helping them buy those set of guitar strings or pay for that studio time or uh, pay for the transportation to get to gigs or whatever it is. I, I enjoy that because I'm part of the process. I feel like I'm kind of part of the band because I'm contributing to that. Now, you can do it in all the other ways, like merchandise and, and buying people's music and that sort of thing if you want to provide a tangible thing. But sometimes the intangible, just the feeling, like the mutual feeling. And it took me a long time to stop feeling guilty about accepting donations because kind of felt a bit like a charity case. I felt a bit creepy saying, hey, you, you hardworking person there, you've just gone and done a 12-hour shift in the coal mines, and now I'd really love you to chip me 10 bucks via PayPal so that I can sit here in air-conditioned comfort and maybe make a little tune. How about that? Like, it just felt a bit weird. But over time, I've realized that what I'm providing and what you as a music creator may be providing for people is escapism. You may, be, you may be the one cool thing that they have to look forward to that day. They may want to contribute. They may, may want to give a dollar or two dollars or five dollars or ten dollars to you because that live stream, that hour long live stream of you playing your music on a Friday night was just the thing they needed to recover from their week in the coal mine. So don't devalue it don't it's like compliments the worst thing you can do if someone gives you a compliment is say oh no 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 i'm not really i'm terrible i'm the worst because it makes the person making the compliment feel bad they're trying to do a nice thing for you and you're just rejecting them you're shoving it back in their face the exact same thing goes for a donation instead of getting a donation and suddenly feeling all bad and awkward because you feel like a charity case how about thanks so much really appreciate that really helps me continue to do what i'm doing around here I think it's a good thing. But uh, if you are struggling with that, then maybe that helped you. Maybe that's going to help you push past and realize that donations are A-OK. -okay. Number seven. I hesitated to put this one in here because I have a love-hate relationship with courses. It seems that every man and woman and their dog these days wants to do a course. As soon as you think you got some sort of value and some sort of uh, proposition, you're going to make a course about it. And I think the reason that courses have gotten such a bad rap, and by the way, courses, what we're talking about is educational courses. So let's say you're an amazing pan flautist. Is that what you call them? Pan flute player? You're the, one of the world's best pan flute players. Well, you can just play your pan flute and sell your pan flute music, but why wouldn't you also put together like a 10-hour intensive course about pan flouting and then sell that for, for $49 and see if people that want to learn how to pan flute like you will actually buy your course? Well, <clears throat> on the surface, that's good. That's great. And to be honest, that's what I did with GarageBand. I created a, a GarageBand course. It's five hours of curated content. It's $10. It, uh, it started, it launched at $10, it is $10 right now, and uh, even if you're watching this 10 years in the future, it'll probably be still $10, or maybe it'll be updated by then, <laughs> because, hey, things change over time. <clears throat> I'm not going to say everything has to always remain the same, but the problem with courses is the launch. The course launch has kind of given courses a really bad rap, because what a lot of the focus has come with courses is creating this uh, this income, this sitting on the desert island passive income that everyone dreams about where you release a course, you put your, your emails into auto send, and then you just, be, you, you go out of it. And I don't love that. I think that's actually a bit crap, to be honest, because that's removing exactly the reason why we love the creator environment and the creator economy, which is that you have more access to people, not less. So if you're not familiar with these, you've, you've experienced them, even if you don't think you have. You go into a funnel, a sales funnel. So it usually starts something like this. Creator, the pan flutist, gives you the free two-page ebook, uh, Basics of Pan Fluting, the pan fluting checklist, <laughs> and you download that for free. But free means you provide your email and you must tick a little box that says, I would like to receive promotions. The next day, you receive a promotion saying, we really hope you love the ebook. Did you know we've got this course that usually sells for $297, but because you're special, aka because you decided to go into my sales funnel, 
you get it for only $47. That's $297 worth of value for $47. <gasps> Who could say no to that? Well, you do say no. And then three days later, you get another automated email from the sales funnel that says, oh, we noticed that you didn't uh, decide to use this course. We know how hard it is for folks to find money these days. So we are offering you a one-time only discount of $17. That's right, $297 worth of value for just $17. You go, well, come on, $17. Who doesn't have $17? You pay your $17, you get the course, you think it's okay. Maybe you watch it, maybe you don't. Maybe you, you become the world's greatest pan flute player. Who knows? Uh, and then, the, again, the nefarious side of this is once you're in that sales funnel and people that create multiple, 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 multiple courses is that they'll keep selling you more and more. You get into the sales funnel. It's called a funnel for a reason because it funnels you down. And then you get into this repeat buying process. Now, that's at the absolute worst end of it. And some people would even defend that and say, <clears throat> that's capitalism, Johns. You got a problem with that? Move to China. <laughs> <laughs> and I would laugh like that. But <clears throat> yeah, it, it is what it is. And uh, you just need to keep it in mind. Now, it's outside of the scope of this video, this podcast, to go into how to set up a course, how to create a course, how to distribute a course, and how to sell a course. But guess what? There's courses about how to sell courses online. Or you can just go to your favorite YouTube search engine and type in how to create and sell a course online. You will find a plethora of both dodgy and undodgy uh, videos and articles all about that. What about uh, number eight? What about teaching? Have you ever had a desire to teach? Yeah, if you're a pan flute player, uh, let's get away from the pan flute. Let's say you love your ukulele and you're really good at ukulele. You spent 10 years studying it and uh, you think you got some ukulele chops. Well, guess what? There's probably a bunch of folks out there that are beginners that would love to pay you 30 bucks an hour to teach them the ukulele. And it, depending on where you live in the world and what some of the rules are around around how, to, how you can actually monetize the sales and of, of lessons, uh, some things need more qualifications and requirements than others. So check your local areas and what you can and can't do. But the vast majority of the time, if you're good at a thing and you want to teach it to someone and you want to and they want to pay you to do it, you can do it. Now, keep in mind, something I should have mentioned, you know, around number one is that anything that you do that monetizes your music that gets you money is income. Yeah, I know. I was shocked too. It is income. So depending again where you live in the world and what the rules are around that and how much you can and can't make, you will almost definitely be subject to some sort of income tax or at least income tax assessment. Can you choose to not declare that $30, $40 that you made for that ukulele lesson because it was cash in hand and because Barry's a good guy and he definitely wouldn't go and tell the, the feds. Yeah, if you want to make that choice. But keep in mind that so much stuff is digital these days. So much stuff is tracked digitally. If you're being paid by Venmo or PayPal or anything like that, those businesses have an obligation to make sure they have your tax details, to report any payments to tax authorities. It is. it is. Is it Big Brother? Yeah, a little bit. But it's because so many people have gone around the system in the past. So little pause on that one just to remind you of your obligations to pay your taxes. What are there? There's only uh, two things that are guaranteed in life, right? Uh, but yeah, teaching, maybe you want to teach. Maybe it's as simple as you stick something up on your Facebook page, say ukulele lessons, $30 an hour, contact me for details. Or if you want to get out in the real world, I know this was focused on not having to leave your home, but go to your local community center, go to your local cafe, put out one of those flyers that has the little phone number tear off things on there. If you want to go super old school, do some uh, petitioning. What, are, what do they call it? Like uh, letterboxing, leaflet dropping, put those annoying things under people's windscreen. What? No, don't do that. Those things are annoying. You get in your car and you don't realize it's there and then you turn it on and uh, yeah, it causes problems. Maybe don't do that. But yeah, you can, you can offer your services out there and why not? If you've got the expertise, you'll be surprised. And remember, even if you're not <clears throat> what you'd consider the biggest expert in a topic, if you're a few levels ahead of... When I first started teaching GarageBand on YouTube, I wasn't a GarageBand expert. I was a GarageBand beginner. But as I was learning things, I was putting out a lesson about it and then learning the next thing and then putting out a lesson. So it's kind of that subtle Simpsons joke. As long as you're staying one lesson ahead of the kid <laughs> or one, head, one lesson ahead of the person you're teaching, you're fine. Because And, and to be honest... 
Sometimes the best teachers, the best teaching, the best education comes from people who have just learned something, not people who are experts. Because once you're an expert, it's really hard. I'm a huge hockey fan, as people watching the video version can see. I'm wearing my Golden Knights hockey hat. Uh, I'm a big hockey fan. And Wayne Gretzky, who was one of the greatest, if not the greatest player of all time, was not a good hockey coach. Not because he didn't know how to do it, but because it can sometimes be hard for someone who's an absolute expert in something to explain to someone who's not how to do it and how to get the best out of those people. It's why the best coaches are almost never the best players. When was the last time in any sport or any occupation you found that someone who was the best coach was actually someone who was formerly the greatest player of all time? Michael Jordan, not a coach. Wayne Gretzky, not a coach. Andre Agassi, as far as I know, not a coach. Probably also not the best tennis player ever, but I liked him. He had Spunk. He had Hutchba. He had Brooke Shields for a while. All right, let's move on to uh, <coughs> getting a little bit off track. Let's go to number nine. Uh, this is my, we're getting into my bread and butter here now because I realized early on that my music was fun. My music was good. My music was fine. Was I going to be able to make a full-time living out of just my music in terms of selling my music and people streaming my music? Absolutely not. So what did I turn to? Teaching, but a very particular, particular, that's like specific and particular, a very particular type of teaching called tutorials. Yes, I decided I wanted to make tutorials, mostly because when I started creating music on my iPhone and my iPad using GarageBand, I couldn't find really detailed in-depth tutorials and training about how to do what I wanted to do, which was plug in guitars, plug in microphones, record keys, mix, master, release songs using my iPhone and iPad and GarageBand. So I made them. I made tutorials. Now, how do you monetize tutorials? Well, on YouTube, you can join the YouTube Partner Program. Yay, everyone, join it right now. Wait, what's that? Yeah, you need to have a 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 hours of watch time in a one-year period. So you need to start doing this and doing it for a while and getting quite good at it before you can monetize it. Now, is that the worst thing in the world? Probably not, because everyone starts at zero anyway. And your early videos, if you create video tutorials, your early videos are probably not gonna be great. Does that mean you shouldn't start doing it right now? No, it means you probably should start doing it right now. In fact, the earlier you start doing it, the better it's going to be for you, because why not? Why not get started now? I hear this from a lot of people. They're like, oh, I could never do that. I couldn't do what you do. It's like, well, no, you're saying it wrong. You can't do what I do yet in the exact same style that I do. You may have your own amazing style that will work for a certain subset of people, and you may not have honed exactly how you're going to present that yet because you've never tried doing it. But guess what? Just start. Just start doing it. Just try doing it. And do I want to create another thousand people all making the same sort of video tutorials that I do? Well, yes and no. Yes, I want you to get out there and start creating tutorials if you have a passion for a thing and you want to share that passion. And the second part of that is it's not going to be just like me. I'm sorry, but you are not going to be as good a Pete Johns as I am. Just like I'm not going to be as good a Joe Smith as you are. How freaky if Joe Smith, if you're Joe Smith and you're watching this right now, you're like, Wow, he's talking right to me. And now my shoes are talking right to me. What was in that cookie? I don't know. So tutorials, fun times, good times, do tutorials. And again, even if you only do it to see if you can do it, just try and create a tutorial. And there's heaps of ways to do it. I share a lot of information. Again, to be shameless self-promoter on my Patreon, I do a lot of behind the scenes stuff. So you'll find out. You can ask me. I'll share everything about how I create tutorials, how I share my screen, how I show my mouse clicks, how I record my voiceover, how I do everything to create a tutorial. It's not as hard, especially in 2023, 24. It's not as hard as you think, and it's not as hard as it once was. Speaking of things, that are not as hard as they once were. Let's go to our final number 10. And it's something that I do now on a weekly basis. I do it three times a week. Yeah, I know, I'm a very lucky man. I get to do it three times a week. What is it? It's live streaming. Yeah, of course it is. It's doing a live stream. And because of things like StreamYard that I mentioned earlier and Restream and uh, the fact that you can stream now to Instagram and TikTok and uh, uh, YouTube and Facebook and all the places, live streaming has taken off. Twitch, 
need I forget to Twitch? Twitch is the the kind of the home, the the OG live stream. So there are so many places you can live stream. And the criticism of live streaming of late has been, no, now now that everyone can do it, everyone's doing it and it's saturating and so many people are live streaming. And look, the part of that I agree with is that live streaming for the sake of live streaming is very rarely great. (laughs) If you see these live streams that are like uh, a live hangout and it's someone that's like, oh, uh, no one's here yet. I'll just wait for some people to get here. Oh, oh, Greg 401. Greg 401, do you have any questions? Greg, Greg, what, what do you have anything you want to talk about? Oh, okay. Let, what, what should we talk about? Um, uh, what, what's in the news? Uh, what, what? Should, oh God, no! Don't look at the news. Uh, so yeah, if you don't have any purpose, gonna be tough. Gonna be tough with your live streaming. So have a purpose. Start small. The best and the easiest way to start with live streaming. Let's say you're a creator. We'll go back to that. We'll go, get away from the pan pipes and the ukulele. You're a creator. You're an artist. You're a band. You're a, you're a single performer. Whatever it is, uh, what live stream should you do? Uh, I don't know. Maybe music. <laughs> Maybe you playing music. It's obviously the simplest and easiest. Put on a little concert, a little four or five song gig. Pretend it's an open mic night. Put the stream on, play, and then stop. Do you have to stream to anyone? By the way, when you start, no. You can stream to a private stream. You can stream unlisted with oh, pretty much every platform. You can practice doing it. You can even just record yourself. Pretend you're live streaming, but don't. Will anyone show up to your early live streams? It's unlikely. They don't know you're doing it. You've got to give them a chance. You've got to give them a chance to find you and know what you're doing and prove you're going to do something interesting and engaging that there's actually going to be value in. And that's the key. It's got to be valuable. The other things that you might want to do is a specific topic. Yeah, topic-based live streaming. Uh, Tell a story about a gig. I would love to see that. My favorite band, if they did a live stream that was like our most challenging gig ever, and it was just the band there just talking and telling a story for half an hour, I would be enraptured with that. I would love to hear that. So that could be something really cool. Or how the gear I use. Again, you can tie all this together. If you're a band, why not set up your affiliate link, that kit page that I talked about before with all the gear you use, and then set up a camera and do a live stream. Like, uh, here's the gear we use. Got questions? Q&A about the gear we use. You show your guitars, your keys, your amps, your microphones. Why not? Like, that would be cool. I would love to know. I would love to geek out and know the nerdy side. If you're a guitar person... I would love to know the pedal boards, like a, a detailed live stream going through all the pedals on the pedal board of my favorite guitarists. Yes, please sign me up. So yeah, live streaming has got a bit of a bad rap because everyone can do it now. You can, anyone can sign up to StreamYard or sign up to an account and just live stream out to the world. Doesn't mean you should. And if you want to though, just have a topic, have a purpose, have a goal, have something. Think about it from the listener point of view. Do unto others as you think they want to be done unto in terms of make sure that you're actually delivering something of value to an end user. There you go. 10 ways that you can make money from your music without leaving the comfort of your audio cave. Or, of course, you can get out there and gig. We didn't talk about that. But, of course, you can get out there and play live gigs, go to open mic nights, go to band nights, do all the things and build up a reputation in your local community because that's another way that you can go. But that is 10 ways. Some of them you may have thought about. Some maybe you've never thought about before. And maybe you want to give some of them a try. There are some links down in the description if you're watching the video version or you can head over to studiolivetoday.com if you're listening on the podcast to find out all of the ways that you can get interactive. So if you want to do things like distributing your music, check out DistroKid, link down in the description. If you want to see how I use affiliate sales, feel free to go to my gear guide and uh, take a look at the links there. It's very simple. And the merchandise, buy yourself a Studio Life Today mug and see how the merchandise process with Spring works end to end. Hope you found something interesting in this one. If you did and you're watching the video version, big thumbs up because the sun's up. If you're listening on the podcast version, I would love you to leave a review and a rating on your podcatcher of choice and all that's left to do is say what we say at the end of each and every show and video and podcast and that is please be kind to yourself be kind to others and keep creating i'll see ya next time
Hey folks, Pete here. It's the bit after the bit. Yeah, I know, a very special bit just for folks watching on the live premiere. We've got Jade Star coming up in just a jiffy, so you'll be dumped over there very soon. Keep an eye out for that one. We've got a big weekend coming up here on Studio Live today, so we have a happy hour. We have your music live. We have the 200th episode of Garage Band Weekly with myself and Patrick from the Garage Band Guide, so it's going to be a good old time around here. Just wanted to say another huge thank you to everyone. Thanks to all those folks who have been supporting me, who have been donating to the channel, who are patrons uh, over at Patreon, and uh, just for being awesome people. I really appreciate it. I had to miss a live stream last week because I was unwell, and uh, the, the outpouring of love from all you folks was amazing. So thank you for that. And again, thank you for, for listening and watching this podcast just as it's coming out. You are on the bleeding edge of studio life today. Awesomeness. All right. Stand by now for Jade. I'll see you over there. 